Claire is an Australian-based vegan psychologist, communications trainer, and animal rights campaigner. She consults with people all over the world to help address the personal and social challenges of being vegan and living in a non-vegan world, and is the author of Vistopia, The Anguish of Being Vegan in a Non-Vegan World. So without further ado, please welcome Claire. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And welcome to everyone who has joined this conference. It's very exciting for me to be involved in the inaugural uh, Animal Advocacy Conference 2020. And I'm calling in from Australia. And I imagine there are people, I know there are people all over Asia, but also all over the world who have joined. So it's my absolute pleasure to, to actually be here. And I would have seen some of you, I guess, at, at different conferences. So what I've been asked to talk about today, which is such an important subject, is the importance of self-care. And it's a topic we hear about a lot is, you know, how do we care for ourselves when some of the work we do is really so challenging and I've been an animal activist and a vegan for 10 years. And sometimes you think you've seen it all and then something else will happen and you almost can't believe it. Um, but our requirement, our passion, of course, for animal liberation is so great. And what we see with our eyes is nothing what these animals, of course, experience with their bodies. And so it's very important that we find strategies to constantly resource ourselves because the animals need us here, not only today, they need us tomorrow, next week, next year, and for the next decades. And we are seeing massive changes in what is happening in people's relationship with animals, how we see animals, despite all some sad stories, of course, but things are definitely changing. And I know since the time I've been doing this. So I'm going to be sharing with you a number of tools and techniques and things you can do immediately because, you know, some of us are going to be involved in undercover work. We're going to be seeing images. We're going to be editing materials and it's challenging. And it's very easy for this to stay in our bodies and for us to ultimately become depressed because it's heavy in our bodies. But there are things we can do to move this through our body without us being distracted, without us depressing things or imagining they're not there, which, of course, it comes back to bite us. So in talking to you know fellow vegans and activists around the world i remember talking to sean monson who of course was the director of earthlings and he said well, claire we've got to find a way to let this filter through our bodies and so that we can be there uh, for animals and also it's important that we collaborate with other people and we come together and there are ways in which we can do this so I'm going to be interacting with you a lot today. I want to know the sort of work you're involved in. I want to get to know you. There'll be plenty of time for questions and comments. And I'm also going to be quite flexible because we're talking about self-care, but you know, I'm involved in a lot of areas and um, I love to share with what people are doing and anything I can help with or redirect people to connect with other people. So, so let's begin. And uh, let's get the technical bit first done, shall we? Here we go. Let's have a look. And I'm hoping, I'm sure, can people wave to me if this is happening and you can see this? Excellent, lovely. <laughs> now, this is a beautiful image of a, a now happy bile bear, of course. And I know there's going to be people in Asia involved in this. And I know um, in Animals Asia Conference, this is Animal Advocacy Asia, of course, um, you know, some of the work they're doing, and I'm, I'm very close to that, what happens particularly with bile bears. And uh, and this is one that was in a sanctuary. Looks like he's on the telephone, doesn't he? <laughs> Which is wonderful. But um, so really it is about the importance of self-care in, in enhancing our vegan advocacy. I'm just going to move my little picture a little bit to the right. That's great. Because if I always see it like a bit of a bank account, really, if we what we need to do is to constantly put credit in the bank, so to speak, to enhance ourselves. And I've seen people that are burnt out that almost feel guilty looking after themselves. They say, well, the animals are suffering so much. You know, I, I need to be doing more. So but it's very important that we do this. And of course, this is this is a start, just a really bit of an introduction. Of course, you know, veganism, the everything, the philosophy of the non-use and non-exploitation of animals. That's really the moral baseline, um, as we know, of course. And yet we need more activists, animal activists. 
Now, I'm going to share this story with you. Um, this was several years ago when I was doing some work for Anon uh, Anonymous for the Voiceless. And I'm now smiling at this young man. And if there was also a picture captured only minutes before as this young man is looking at some footage that I'm showing him. And his face is crumbling in pain and he is so upset by what he's seeing. But he's even more upset because he said, well, what can I do? You've, you've told me all this information. You've explained it. I don't want to be part of this, but what can I do? And somebody from afar was taking this photograph. I didn't even know it was being taken. We, we didn't know. And, uh, and I said, he said, is there anything I can do? And I said, well, of course, that's the easy bit. I said, and I explained to him that the first step, of course, was to do everything he could not to finance those industries. And this was the face he, he gave. He gave this beautiful smile. And, um, and I think he was soon to become an activist pretty, pretty soon afterwards. This was in Sydney. But we do need more animal activists because um, obviously, by example, the choices we make is very important. But we also need to make this information really available to people. And there are different forms of activism, of course, and we've all got to choose our best sort of calling, but we do have to do something. So thank you very much for being here and, and for everything you're doing. So let's go into a poll, shall we? I'd love to get to know you. Is how long have you been an animal activist? Now you're on the conference, of course, and um, George is going to bring this up for us. Here we go, fantastic. So if people just take a little bit of time to answer that, maybe you've just begun. Um, it could be a short period of time and maybe it's a considerable amount of time. Right. Only just begun is uh, just sort of winning at the moment, so to speak. How wonderful if you have just begun and that a conference like this has come online. Wow. I think people have just about answered then. So our largest number of people have just begun. This is really great because um, I had some really good advice when I began and I've been able to you only use my skills of uh, that what I've known as a psychologist for so long. But great. We've had people a short period of time and then we have so, a number of people a considerable amount of time. So we're going to be calling on very much your experience, which is going to be important, which is great. So perfect. So there's the one. Excellent. So you're going to have lots of questions, you know, any advice, you know, as we go through and there'll be plenty of time for this. So lovely. So I'm just going to come out of that poll, if I may. I mean, I know um, Charles is sorting that for me. Here we go. All right. So what if right, I would like to do the next poll then, of course, here we go. So here we go. Oh, actually <laughs> come back again. Um, what sort of activism are you involved in? So Thank everyone, you. That's please share away mm. what type of activism you're involved in in the chat. I yes. see Amruta from India saying direct action care in animal shelter and online ah, activism. Fantastic. Great. Laurie says in. dog and cat meat trade and promoting yep. veganism. Right. Tahoe says educational online activism. Right. Any more answers, please keep sharing mm. away in the chat. Claire, do you have any comments? Yeah, you know, it's uh, no, this is um, all of these, of course. Um, I think we bring our gifts to the world, don't we? And I think it's really important. Um, you know, either you will have a place that you feel really um, keen to work on, or, you know, we can move around. Sometimes we need to stand back as well and sort of say, gosh, that's a bit too frontline for a moment. I'll do some online or I'll do some uh, the promotional stuff. And then we go back into the hands on sort of work. Fantastic. Right. So just if anybody else wants to add stuff there, the sort of things I've been involved in primarily is uh, live exports is animals leaving Australia to go to different parts of the, the world. Factory farming, of course. And then more recently is animal experimentation. In fact, we've put together a, um, a wonderful training for people um, who can access that online really to actually get involved in those areas, because that's often an area that people don't get involved in because they feel, well, you know, what happens if a professor comes and says, oh, we need this for medical research and they blind you with science. And we've put a training together that even someone who was 18 years old, who had to face a 65 year old professor with all the qualifications coming out of the thing, that they could easily answer the questions because there really is no argument for animal experimentation in terms of the benefits to humans and of course the ethical issues. So, um, so wonderful that uh, I can see the dog and cat meat trade. That's a huge area, of course. We've got online the shelters. So we've got animals that are distressed and also an educational thing. 
Wonderful. Okay. And we can, I'm really going to add some more. So I'd just like to give, if I may, my own journey to becoming an, a vegan activist, if just to set a little bit of the scene, if that's okay. Um, this is actually a, a picture was taken in Australia of something that's known as pig dogging or pig dog hunting. But I'll share with you, um, it was actually in 1979 when I first became aware of what was happening to animals in slaughterhouses. And I didn't see anything. I didn't read anything. Um, hear anything but I was reading a book of someone who had worked in that place and I was so shocked by what I read and I was only 17 years old some of you wouldn't have been born in the 1970s is um I immediately stopped eating meat I didn't realize at the time of course I thought gosh it's a terrible thing that is happening and um and I just stopped doing it and I called myself a vegetarian believing that I of course was making a huge ethical stand which I was um, and didn't really know what else was going on and luckily I was allergic or let's say I was allergic to dairy products. Of course, I wasn't a baby calf. And so that went out of my world as well. So I was virtually on a plant based diet. But it was um, about 10 years, a little bit longer now, 11 years ago. And I was living in New Zealand and I came across this thing called pig dogging where dogs are let loose um, on pigs. And it's a, a very horrible end for these dear animals. And it came, it was on my own doorstep. I was living in the country with my family and I heard these terrible noises at night of dogs that had been put back in cages and I investigated and it was a really horrible scene for pigs and dogs. And I managed to get with my first activism, <laughs> whilst a vegetarian, of realizing that I had to get those animals out and I got them all taken away, all those, all those dogs. And I saved some of the pigs, the piglets that had been left over. But it started to get me to ask questions is what is going on here? This can't just be, you know, a few bad apples, so to speak, and some really awful things. And so it got me to ask more questions and the reason I'm sharing you this story is because when we're sharing our stories with other people and we wonder we never know the point at which they're going to change and they get those moments of inspiration but it got me asking questions and I also came across the dairy industry and baby calves taken away and it started to make me think well I thought I knew something back all those years ago but wow why don't I know this and then coming back to Australia my partner Brendan was went to fully investigate this and looked at a lot of videos and we all sat down together and my whole family including my dogs became vegan on the spot but I realized in that moment is I it helps me to understand people more because there's a lot of people it's not that they don't care but the we are told so shown so much that actually Everything is there to keep the information from us. So we must keep communicating the work that we do by example, directly for animals, but also in sharing those stories. We never know the moment it was to empathize with the suffering of those animals and say, I can't be part of this. So in becoming a vegan, I immediately became an animal activist as well and started speaking out at rallies and particularly about live exports. Um, and that became with Animals Australia, which who was very influenced by Animals Asia. And so I started that journey myself. So that's my bit of my background. And it's taken a bit of a circuitous route. So in doing our animal activism, of course, we want to be part of the solution, which is great, but there is a danger of burnout. And I'm going to be sharing the difference between stress and burnout and some of the sort of what happens within us. And the most importantly, what can we do about it? Because it will come up and bite us without us even knowing, because, you know, when we see stressful things, of course, in everyday life to do with humans, it's distressing. But when we see the scale of this with animals, it can lead to a lot of anxiety, depression, despair, particularly if we don't feel we're making a difference and the animals lead us for the long term. So we're going to have to put these things into place. So let's here we go. So let's have a look. I'm now going to go back to the chat and I hope this is going to come up. I'm sharing with you some of the biggest challenges I've faced, of course, is um, I guess, you know, the speed with which things happen. <laughs> um, one not understanding, not understanding why people don't change, those sort of things. But what about yourself? Um, you know, getting that information when people refuse to see things, um, seeing animal images and videos when I'm going through things to prepare talks. Um, going to do vigils. I do vigils at the, the slaughterhouse at the, you know, when animals are going in there. So all of these things are challenging, but what are your biggest challenges that you face? Excellent. Right. Oh, family not understanding. That is a huge one. And um, I have family in the UK and they're not um, activists and they're not vegans, only my nieces. And it's, it's, we can't understand why. And it's often, it's not, 
us that lead our family to being part of the solution. It's usually other people, um, but we just need to be that example. So what are the other challenges that people face? Maybe it's directly in the work you do. Maybe it's, um, it's often other people and it can be other vegans actually because we are so emotional and, and often we always come to life. I always say we come to animal activism with all the normal problems of life, you know, self-esteem, confidence to enjoy the work we do. We have relationship problems and things. And yet then we throw Vistopia on the top. And I'm going to be sharing that a little bit. My mum could not accept that I don't eat eggs. Um, here we go. And, and when I try to share with her why I don't eat eggs, she refuses to listen. However, she still respects that I don't put egg in my meal. Right, Rachel, just as we're doing this and other ones are coming up, let me give you a little tip here. You know, we say, please, could you just see this, what happens to chickens, the male chickens or the animals that are in the, you know, the boiler chicken, broiler chickens and whatever. Um, when you don't get that and, and, and mom says, oh no, don't show me, it's far too upsetting. Switch to something else, switch to the quality of your relationship. And this is happens, really helpful. We find a lot of teenagers find this. So you can say to mom is, hey mom, you know, I'm really upset that we're not not as close as we used to be and mom if she fell into the relationship with you says well don't be silly you can tell me anything or she'll say oh I'm here for you well actually mom I just don't feel you understand me I feel uh, we're not as close as we well, what's the problem and you could say well because you won't see what has affected me and what makes me believe the things I do and mom will go oh no but I don't want to see that and you say that's fine mom but it just means that we're not as close because there's no way you could possibly understand why I do the work I do you see what I mean? So you switch it to the relationship as opposed to mum, how do you what how do you feel about this? And it's a way of getting mum to see footage. And I find a lot of mums and dads and brothers and sisters or friends will do it because they're really they're being challenged about the quality of their relationship with you. So have a little think about that one. So that's hard, but it's um, that's one a lot of people do. Being exposed to animal body parts every day, absolutely. And we just don't see the same thing, do we? And we often wonder, how could I look at what's in, on people's plates or, and of course being in Asia, and I've certainly worked and walked around some of those markets in Thailand and India and um, mainland China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and, and you know, terribly up distressing apartment when we see things on people's plates as well friends yelling at me when I become when I became an animal activist now that's an interesting one isn't it because often you know it's not we what we don't want is indifference we want people that actually are um affected in fact the more resistance in many ways we're getting to them and why would they do that you know if you were following a healthy diet and they suddenly say hey don't tell me about diet all the time we'd think that was a bit strange their resistance often comes because at some level they know there's something wrong okay and being told that my work is not effective i imagine that um kaho is um from non-vegans or with the world will never change or you'll never make a difference people will never change well that's actually not true. And we don't need the whole world to change. We need a small group, actually, because the majority of people follow. We, this is why we're in this terrible state we are with the, the practices we have. And most people follow everyone else. They conform. So when this becomes normal, um, loss of hope, confidence in fellow humanity, that is one huge thing, of course. How can people do this? We'll be talking about this when we look at Vistopia, some of the definitions, thinking that vegan is too extreme compared to vegetarianism. You know, often people say, oh, why are you a vegan? It's too extreme. Always answer with a question. What do you mean by extreme? What do you understand by veganism? Because often we go in and we talk about animal cruelty, but they're thinking we're just extreme vegetarians with a fussy diet. And once you get them to say, well, it's, you know, extreme vegetarian, well, actually, that's only one thing we do. Can I tell you? And then, of course, you talk about it's really we do everything we can not to use or exploit animals. So now they're basically saying I could never be someone who doesn't stop using and exploiting animals. It's little techniques like this also help works on the brain. And always remember, they may not say in front of us, oh my goodness, I get it. But we have those chinks of consciousness. And that's something I've learned is we never know when the point to change and often we're nudging them along to something. Coming to terms with the amount of cruelty people are capable of. You know, it is often we just cannot come to terms with this. Now, there are psychopaths out there there are people that have no feelings at all. There are people who deliberately want to. There are also a lot of people that are oppressed themselves in a, a system of poverty. Um, we have a lot of immigrants in, you know, work in Australia, we do, working in these establishments. 
and they become numb down. They can't, they start off feeling and they just, you know, can't do that. So, but there are other people, of course, being resistant to stopping the amount of judgment and bullying. Yeah, absolutely. These are all the things we all suffer with, isn't it? Being able, barely able to eat plant-based. Yeah, I don't know what you mean by that. Maybe you could share a little bit about that. Um, is barely um, able, I don't know if that's availability, extreme overbearing sadness, absolutely. There, there, there is a, you know, there's processes we go through, um, stages we go through as well. Uh, my colleague laughed at me when I started a discussion about animal law. Yep, don't do all the heavy lifting. We'll talk about that, getting them to defend the bad and silly things they're saying. Great, okay. Um, they start seeing what happens to animals, animal agriculture, especially the dairy industry. Um, absolutely. But I start getting very absolutely. It's a prolonged suffering. I think we find there someone new. I watch some new videos. I get triggered and emotional. We're going to be looking at strategies that we can get you to pass that through you. So it doesn't become like this great big burden and you just can't take it anymore. If I wasn't a human's greed. I wouldn't want to be extreme either. Absolutely. Yeah, I've started to feel like I can't love people who are not vegan, even if they're my family or very close friends. You know, these are all incredibly normal responses. And uh, and there is a process we go through. You know, we always go through the angry vegan stage and I can still be an angry vegan. <laughs> and anger is when, you know, something we value is being violated. You know, at the basic level, it's being cruel to innocent creatures that have done nothing more than being born as the bodies they are. Okay, so let's have a little. Thank you for sharing all those. And I really appreciate that. Now, I, you might have heard the phrase, everything that people have mentioned there is what we call the burden of knowing. The fact that, you know, our eyes have suddenly been opened in a way that we, things that we didn't see before, very few of us are fortunate enough, I will say, to actually have been born in a family who actually continued us on that vegan journey. I believe we're all born vegan. We are born um, living on this planet, you know, not abusing animals or other people, in fact, but we are these habits and things that happen. Um, so I'm just waiting for my slides here. Dear Charles, lovely. So we'll move on there, please. <laughs> the burden of knowing. Lovely. So all that is, and a lot of people will stay here for a moment. I'll just indicate if I may to you, Charles, as we change, that'll be great. Now, is the term Vistopia. Now, if you haven't heard this, it's a term that I feel we all needed, really, because the, all the things that people have said in this chat box are exactly what is going on here. It's called Vistopia the anguish of being vegan in a non-vegan world. And um, Vistopia then is, just as we're coming back to my slides, is the anguish we feel at knowing about the systematized cruelty towards animals. And then when we tell people, as many of people have said in the chat room, instead of them going, oh my gosh, I must change immediately, they get angry with us. As you've just said, they say, oh, don't tell me what to do. The government would never allow it. We've always done it like this. And then, that you can't believe that happens. It's almost like trance like collusion with this dark and what I call a dystopian world that people don't even know they're part of because we were part of it once and then we go, how is it possible? But then we go, well, if I don't know about that, what else don't we know? And then we're called conspiracy theorists. Lovely. So as I said a moment ago, everything has changed. We used to, you know, see other people having, you know, increasingly in Asian country, I know we drink coffee and, you know, somebody puts milk in their drink or dairy in India, huge amount of dairy is, is used as we don't suddenly see milk anymore. We see a baby calf taken away from their mother. Everything has changed. If anybody's seen this film, The Matrix, it's almost as if the veil has been lifted and it wasn't that before. And that's what we call dystopia. So there's the definition. I've just told you that is the dark and dystopian world you don't even know there's a part of. And when we question those covers up and we say, well, you know, it is a lot of it. I know when I'm explaining to people in Australia, I say, you know, a lot of this is legal and standardized practice. And people can't believe that because the average person, I believe the average person does not deliberately want to be cruel to other living beings. It's they see it as a, an unnecessary and indirect animals are different animals don't feel pain. There's all this sort of thing. But the majority of people don't want to be part of this. It is separated from there. Lovely. Let's have a look at some of the emotional reactions. And I want you to look at that. Now, some of those put those in the chat, but maybe we can um, say whether these sort of um, link with you as well. 
there is enormous anger and someone said that you know I can't believe I don't even like how can I how can I like vegan non-vegans how can I surely they're just selfish now I used to think that when I first became a vegan um and I'll tell you a quick we'll, we'll go through this and I'm going to tell you a quick story that I told of some I shared of someone who really wanted to become vegan after seeing some of the footage at anonymous for the voiceless but there's intense grief and grief involves anger disbelief bargaining I'll do anything to change this there's a depression there's this sort of um you know but then there can be recovery through that and that's when we transmute that into powerful action for change you've said it this frustration of being able to wake people up we feel alienated from non-vegans we don't have a lot in common. You know, my close friends are vegans, people that I was close to for many years. I don't have that intimacy with them because this moral baseline isn't there, not because they're horrible people, but they just have not actually um, um, empathized with the suffering of animals. But there's also loneliness at groups that we feel previously felt part of, things that would be very enjoyable. Um, and I know a lot of vegans in my research say, well, animal activists really say things it, everything seems trivial you know things that you know I used to go and even watching movies and it's important that we bring that back into our life I think because we need to resource ourselves now I don't know what picture you're seeing here at the moment I've got my little slides here so I'll keep talking anyway but all of these are symptoms of dystopia let's have a little look here I'm gonna have to have super human um Charles, you want me? here we go, lovely. So we got despair and hopelessness and things you talked about, and then you're not able to affect things at a global level. And people feel that. So um, and you were saying, will things ever change? Now, I'm very, despite all the things that go on in the world, despite the real challenges we've had in 2020, I'm actually so positive. And the reason I tell you that is because it's people like yourselves that are out there doing things, but actually because in all social change, it takes a small number of people. Most people don't consciously wake up, empathize with animals, and then will be people that whose lives are led in a philosophical way. But what they will do is follow other people. And they, if it's not normal to eat animals, they won't do it. Okay, it's not normal to abuse animals and, and buy cosmetics or um, have practices and religious rituals and festivals and spiritual practices that involve animals. They won't do it. They'll do it because they will follow the norm. Our job is to reach a critical mass to actually do that. So let's go on to our next poll then, so we can actually see some of the broader things. Now, so you've seen some of those, but what aspect of dystopia do you experience? And I've only just pulled out a few here, and I know in the chat we were able to, to say a lot of things. There's anger, we're looking at intense grief. Um, you can, uh, it's multi-choice, tick as many as apply. Now, 100% of people despair and hopelessness. I hope by the end of this talk and by the end of this conference, you're gonna be thinking, wow, firstly, you'll get really inspired by how many people are out there doing it. We are definitely not on our own, okay? Alienation, huge one, intense grief, anger. Yeah, absolutely. As I said earlier, anger is really when we, something we value is being violated. How is it possible for people to do this to animals? How is it possible for people to walk through a market in the middle of um, northern China and, and see what happens in plain sight? How can they not be affected? It's very hard for us to, to know this, isn't it? Okay. Um, okay, so we've got a lot of grief. We've got anger. And we need this anger is something we can transmute into positive action. What we don't want is anger that's turned on ourselves becomes depression. Feelings of being alone. Absolute. That's why social support is essential. Having other vegans around us and despair and hopelessness. Let me hold that possibility for you that we are going to change this. Um, you know, it's, it will come and go. But having these resources by the end of this is going to be very important. Okay. Now, so in a survey, done just so that you find you're not alone is 83 percent of vegans said they experienced dystopia since becoming vegan because they've suddenly been opened up to the extent of animal exploitation 
And 51%, their part said that was huge, actually. I don't know what it's like in Asia. This Well, this was all over the world. This was a the survey I did. Is 51% said their partner was not interested in becoming vegan. And that, that is a huge thing. And that's something I've started to address of late. How do we live with non-vegans? Someone we've a really otherwise caring, compassionate partner who just can't extend that window of compassion to animals. 59% said they're the only vegan in the family. That's huge for people. And 63% seek fellow, fellow vegans to help with their dystopia. That is very important. Having people around us, we feel we don't have to sort of um, change or or manipulate what we're saying to people we can just be ourselves and tell people and a problem shared is often a problem half so just looking there we can actually see we've looked at that anger anxiety dep depression this was a survey i did it, it is two years ago post-traumatic stress disorder this is particularly when people are involved in activism and that's why i'm spending a little bit of time on this at the beginning because particularly if we've just begun is you know this is very very important also, I've come across vegans that are suicidal. They say, I cannot live in this world. It is, they feel that, but they, the second thing that I would say 95% of vegans have said in my research, when I've talked to people, I feel I don't want to live in this world anymore, but I could never live, leave because I have to be there for animals. That says something absolutely amazing about activists, uh, but it would be understandable that amount of despair and grief. But the fact, because we say, I don't want to live in this world anymore. It just seems to be so cruel. Okay. So I'm hoping this is telling us we're not on our own. All right. Now this is where um, I think we might have even um, answered this already because we've actually started to look at this, but what about guilt? Um, it, that hasn't come up so far, but that's another one that people talk about is, you know, I cannot forgive myself for what I did before I became vegan. And that is really important to for us to forgive ourselves because we didn't know. OK, guilt is when we feel we've done something wrong. Shame is when we feel we are wrong. OK, but what about burnout? This is one I particularly want self blame, hopelessness. We've, we've put up on those, particularly on burnout, because that's something I do want to pick up on. People can actually put anything in the chat there. Okay, here we go. Uh, here we go. Browser. All right. I can see some sort of things we can actually do. All right. Great. Oh, people supporting there. Lovely. All right. Excellent. So let's have a go. So I think a lot of you have already started to share. You've told me what some of those symptoms are. So we can actually add those through. You can see it from other people's, you know, I can't be talking to you at the moment. Unfortunately, you know, when we see each other face to face, we will. Let's go on to another poll then. I have nobody got five polls throughout. So we're not going to be doing this every two minutes. I want to share some real strategies with you. But let's be just aware of time. So on. We'll do this quickly, but what triggers your dystopia? Okay, so I'm trying to get a bit of a, a feel for who's in the audience here, really, so that, okay. Seeing firsthand images of animal cruelty. I know that's a huge one. Dealing with people who appear not to care. Yeah, that's hard, isn't it? If, you know, when we first become vegan, we think, oh my gosh, I just have to tell people. And then we tell them, but it's, this is a little tip as well. It's not, and you're learning this through the conference, no doubt. It's not, if we just had facts alone on every argument, we would win ethics, you know, animal social justice, health, environment, but it isn't that. We have to get them to emotionally connect with the suffering of animals and expand that span, that window of compassion. Here we go. Dealing with people who appear not to care, people refusing to see or hear what happens to animals. Okay, and then other. If we can actually put other in the pool, that would be good. So the biggest one is dealing with people not to care. I was going to share a story with you, wasn't I? Now, then I was out doing street activism and there was this woman who was looking at the footage of what was happening in factory farms. And it was pretty graphic because anybody who's done any AV work knows. And they were watching that and um, she was so distressed by this. And she said, oh, my gosh, I don't want to be part of this. Um, and I, she said, what can I do? And of course, I said to her, well, the first part, of course, is that there's something you can do right now not to finance these industries and also be an example. And I told her about becoming a vegan, which was, you know, not actively participating in, in, in making changes to our lives. And she said, but I can't become vegan. And how easy it would have been for me to say, well, how can she be so selfish? She's so upset by what she's seen. But she said, I could never become vegan. I just can't do that. 
that's where we have to check our assumptions, okay? And I, this is a little tip for you to think about when you're talking to people, because was she selfish? But I put aside that assumption and I said to you, so where do you I don't understand. You're very upset by this. You said you don't want this to happen to animals. We've got an immediate solution so that we stop being part of it before we start doing other things like street outreach and other things. What is it that stops you? Remember, I didn't ask her why. When we ask someone why they defend themselves, what is it that stops you? And she said to me, I'm Italian. She said, I um, animal, uh, animal products, meat and things are very important in or traditional um, Italian cooking. My marriage is in a certain amount of difficulty. My mother-in-law doesn't think I'm a very good cook in Italian cooking because I'm, you know, I'm just not good at that. She said, now I'm going to go home and tell them I'm vegan. She said, I think my marriage will be over and my family will push me out. So that's a little tip to you to actually always ask people, what is it that stops you? Yeah, because if I had judged her as being this horrible, selfish person, I would have been wrong. That woman had she was suffering and struggling already. She's now struggling, struggling about animals and she just needed help to get over the line and actually deal with communicating that. OK, and if I had, so bear that in mind, when I did that, I said to her, well, now, you know, you can't unknow. And what happens is you're not going to be able to live with this. And we can talk about how you can communicate with your family and, and also invite them to make the changes because ultimately they do. And all vegans wish they had become vegans many, many years ago. And then wouldn't it be awful if they said, why didn't you tell me? All right. So all just bear that a little bit in mind. So I'm just do that. And I'm just going to stop this here. OK, so do we have anything? We, so this is one of our biggest things, dealing with people who appear not to care. Absolutely. We'll be looking at some of the things we can certainly do. But it is hold the possibility that some of them just have, are in a trance. They also they cut themselves off from that sort of level of pain. Indifference is something we don't want. When it is, don't show me anything. If you look at the body, I don't want to know about it. Oh, my gosh, it's not my problem. But when it's indifference, it says, well, this is what just matters. You know, we've got to find other ways to, to break through that. Sometimes they won't. And that is so hard. Um, but my experience over 10 years is that a lot of it is resistance and they don't want to connect. I've seen people work in slaughterhouses, um, numb themselves to that and go home. If anybody hurt their dog, they would be really in trouble. So what our window is to expand that window. OK, this is challenging, but let's make some real changes for animals as well. OK, so before we begin actually looking at what we can do to self-care, I need to explain to you and we'll move on. Next slide, please. We'll move quite quickly on these. We need to understand stress and burnout. OK, burnout sort of you know, tells us this, what the actual phrase is. Now, it is a state of emotional, mental and often physical exhaustion brought on by prolonged or repeated stress. Now, this is really important because if you're out there working in frontline work, you're working, you know, rescue animals that have been coming into a sanctuary. If you're advocating for the um, dog and cat trade, if you're working with exotic animals or bile bears, or you're working in some outreach group, you're a lot of people. What I, my research told me in preparing for this conference, a lot of um, activists are really undercover in Asia because for obvious reasons, they you know want to keep that stuff very private. Burnout is very um, familiar to those people unless they regularly take ways to actually pass that, you know, manage that, okay? So it's prolonged or repeated stress. So we have to do something about the stress. I'm gonna teach you three techniques today to allow that to not only change our mindset, but pass it out of our body, okay? These are techniques that I use in general psychology, but also I use myself. I've, I've, I do a lot of emceeing, so I'm showing people earthlings, thousand eyes, dominion, which is the Australian version, and my goodness, does it affect me? But these techniques enable it not to stay in the visceral feeling in my body, uh, anger. Now, burnout is really like stress. It's the emotional, physical exhaustion, the mental, we, we feel prolonged thing. But when it gets to a stage we can't take it anymore, we feel disillusioned. And we say, I just feel hopeless, okay? Now that's a really slippery slope because it's a slippery slope for the animals because we can't, they don't need us to be, they really don't need us to be helpless. Um, and that's where we really need to recognize it and give ourselves permission to take it out, make sure we're still putting stuff back in the, in the credit in the bank, okay? So now ideally we want to remove a stressor. 
Okay, say it was everyday life, say we've got a job that is really stressful, we'd be looking potentially if it was available to work in other areas. If we're in a relationship that's abusive, or you know, where um, we live in a highly polluted area, but we have the chance to move, or we, we're living in a very noisy environment, or we try to do something about that. However, you know, we are really in the lion's den almost, so to speak, aren't we? It's because we're we don't want to walk away from, we can't walk away from the animals. So we can't remove the stressor. So we have to do something else. And I put this on, it's like a bridge. We can have, you know, quite heavy loads going across the bridge a few times, and then the foundations are really going to, to give in. So we can take this for a while, but we need to constantly take, do things that are going to immediately move things out of our body, but also for the long term. Okay, and I'm a living example of someone that regularly puts in daily self-care to enable me to 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 keep going and, and knowing that this is my life's work now. Looking at I know I'm spending a little bit of time on this and deliberately, so I'm gonna move quite quickly because we've talked about this already. At a physical level, just test in with yourself. There can be panic attacks where people feel they're very, very anxious. We can move to numbness, lack of energy, self and self-medication. And in the terms of too much coffee, and um, we may eat badly, um, recreational drugs, um, you know, all these sort of um, alcohol, all these sort of things. At a psychological level, we've we've felt some of these, we've talked about it, but particularly anger. We're not empowered when we're angry um, until we transmute it into something else. It actually drains us of energy. But at a social level, it is those deteriorating relationships, and often we don't care. You know, we think, well, who gives a damn for my knowledge? If they can't be vegan, the, the slightest thing, why should I care? Um, and that's often an excuse for them not to look further, unfortunately. I don't believe we have to be perfect, but um, often intolerance. And we act out of our normal, typical behavior. Um, we are an instrument for change. I use the image of an animal in a cage. And I feel at the end of the day, if I said to them, hey, how did I do today advocating for you? Would they be happy with me? Sometimes they'd tell me off, I'm sure, because <laughs> I'm not perfect. But other times they would say, yeah, and now it's time to just take a little bit back because I need you to help me, but I need you to help all sentient beings. OK, so moving on, just think about that for a moment. And um, where are you on this? And I'm telling you this because if you've only just begun, be aware of this because it is a slippery slope. All right. So a lot of this is understanding. All right. Now, let's just check in with the audience here. OK, how dear do you feel you are to burnout? We've only got five polls throughout this. So this is our main bit of gathering information at the moment. So not mere to burn out at all. Sometimes when we first begin, we are so energized by what we naturally know. OK, so somebody's answered that. Heading in that direction, we've got some people. Um, have people that are burnt out. Great. Well, I'm hope I know these strategies will help you. I, I use them myself. And I'm not going to teach anything to you that you know I'm don't use myself. And there's nobody answering at the point of giving up. And um, and that's why you're here, <laughs> because there's enormous resources for you. So a lot of them is heading in that direction. So I'm really glad I spent some time doing this because it is really important. So you're not near burnout at all, but you're getting some sort of idea of what that is. There anything we want to add in the chat here, please do. If there's anything we can do to sort of add a little bit of um, light to this, but really it's heading in that direction. I couldn't have met you at a better time because knowing what we're going to know today is things that you can use daily. And then there's going to be some really good practices we want you to put in place and you will be able to hang on in there for the long haul. Yes. I don't know if you know the um, uh, writer and uh, animal lawyer actually called um Gary Francione, and I was listening to a podcast of his. Have a, a little look at his work. He's pretty radical. He's an abolition, abolitionist through and through. I believe we're all abolitionists, actually. Sometimes we, we do things that improve a lot of animals to improve for them at the moment, holding that banner of, of true animal liberation. But he has been an advocate, an activist for 40 years. And he was asked, he said, well, I, I've never taken a holiday in 40 years. And people said, well, does that mean you don't even take a weekend off? And he said, no, he said, because, and he, he sort of said it in the sense of, he said, I have such daily and weekly and monthly routines. That means I've been able to advocate for 40 years. So I've been learning a lot from people like this and realizing that when we pace ourselves, all of us need to step up our activism when we're doing it. I know by even being here, but that's really important. 
isn't it wonderful to know there are activists out there that have been going for 40 and 50 years? There's two of them I know in Australia, the um, founders of Animal Liberation, New South Wales and, and Victoria, coming up for 50 years. And they're pretty two amazing women, Linda Stoner and um, Patty Mark. And if you get involved in DXE at all, Patty Mark was um, named the term open rescue. And apparently DXE was founded um, on some of the work she'd actually done. But these are people that I've learned from and can share these tools with you. All right, so we're heading in that direction. So I am so glad where you're gonna be leaving with some really powerful tools today. We'll move quickly on this one, but common dysfunctional ways in which people do this, coffee, alcohol, binging. You know, I find it's not so much um, alcohol, funny enough, that um, vegans use, but it's food, it's starchy food, cigarettes, less so because, of course, that in, well, <laughs> once people find out about what happens to animals, um, they soon come off those. Um, but recreational drugs, that is something that I have seen increasingly in the animal community. Because um, we want to change this, we want to get out of this reality. It's very, very hard uh, dealing with this. But I'm going to teach you some really good functional ways to be doing this. But a lot of zoning out, distractions. But what we don't want is dissociation. And that can happen. Uh, the worst case of this sort of dissociation or guilt and co combination well, there's an undercover agent in Australia that was working in this capacity. And they used to go to bed with their clothes on and even their shoes because they felt if I was ever called out in the middle of the night to go and do a rescue, to go and do some undercover footage, to get that information, I need to be ready. So in other words, they felt such a level of guilt um, that in many ways they bur nearly burnt themselves out. Luckily we were able to help them come back from the brink there because that per the body will shout very loudly and say, sorry, I can't do that. And um, we don't want to burn out what we can't be there for animals. OK, but this is very so recognize if you're doing any of this stuff that is overworking, that is, you know, not exercising, not eating well, not drinking enough water, not um, putting practices, things like meditation. We're going to be talking about do yoga, exercise, fresh air. You know, this is really important. But we often when we're we're head down and looking at the computer, trying to get the footage out that we've done, share it online petitions and um, deal with other non other vegans deal with our family it is very challenging we've got to keep you know imagine it's like a, an overdrawn bank account house so <laughs> you like that i do like these images i hope all right well and on again please these strategies increase the likely of burnt out if we use dysfunctional strategies that is not going to help us so let's move to our next one let's move in the direction of becoming I'm not used to not managing my slides. Normally I just better do this and flip backwards and forwards. But Charles, you're doing a great job. Mm -hmm. Particularly as you're in another country and there's a little bit of a lag. How do we avoid a burnout? This is beautiful animals in Thailand, um, Indian um, animals, aren't they beautiful? And um, how do we avoid it? Now, the first one, there's three techniques I'm going to teach you and I'm going to show you. This is absolutely essential to, and it'll be a practice before we, um, I might actually need a little bit of more light on me, actually. I'm just going to have a friend just add that for me and turn one of the other lights off. It, the first technique is breathing. It might sound so simple, but what happens in our nervous system is very essential. When we are doing animal advocacy and we are, you know, there's a lot of anxiety. Our normal reaction is almost to take a deep breath. We've got a very shallow breath. Check in with your breathing at the moment. It's probably very, you know, it can be very shallow because partly because we're never taught to breathe properly. When we are, we do that, we, you know, we're looking at footage or we're busy or we're stressed, our sympathetic nervous system kicks in. It's, it releases hormones, cortisol and adrenaline, um, which are sympathetic to the fact that we're under stress. We're seeing troubling images. We're angry with our family. When we breathe out, the parasympathetic nervous system kicks in. That's why when we're, you know, we've run for the train and we're late and we almost missed it and we knew we'd be late for something, we go, oh, we try and slow our breathing down. We automatically know intuitively. But this is going to be really important because we get used to not doing this. But I also want us to, to link this with something else because all the two other techniques I'm going to show you, I want you to do this in prior to it. So with the moment, let's do an exercise together. 
Okay, maybe you're someone who does yoga. And if you do, it is absolutely priceless. It's something I've done for 40 years. I only do about 10 minutes a day, but I've been able to therefore keep it up. That's another little technique. It's best to do little and often and keep it up consistently. So just check in with your breathing. If we had a little biofeedback machine here, you would see changes in your heart rate. You'd see different hormones come into the body. So just check in with the breathing and then just deepen that breath. Now, if you can hear any noise in the background, I've got animals wandering around in and out the house here, coming in and drinking water. So that's they've come to join us. Just deepen that breath and let it come out of your mouth. I want you to breathe in to the count of four. One, two, three, four. Do this with me now. Out through the mouth. Five, six, seven, eight. Breathing in, coming up through the stomach. One, two, three, four, like a waterfall coming out. Five, six, seven, eight. Just keep that going for a moment. Coming in and coming out. Coming in and coming out. Now, when we link people up to machines that can measure this, we are able to actually see changes in the activity of our parasympathetic nervous system. This is a tool that we all could use. Now, also to do with self-soothing. I give myself a little pep talk. Imagine you've just rescued an animal. All right. I remember, you know, rescuing chickens out of a, a, a battery thing. And I was so distressed and so traumatized. I wonder if they were going to be hurt yet again. And of course, I spoke to that animal. It's going to be OK. You're safe now. It's OK. Take, you know, everything's fine. Just, you know, breathe. It's OK. I'm here. You would give that animal like you would talk to a small child um, or any child or a friend who was in danger. It's OK. Take a deep breath. It's OK. We'll get through this. OK. All right. Is so self-soothe yourself. OK. It's going to be OK. I can handle this. OK. I know when I'm looking at footage, particularly really troubling footage that say of um, I see a lot of things on slaughterhouses and, and things in different countries. I often say to myself, it's not happening now. The animal that I'm watching in that footage is no longer alive. Now, I know that doesn't solve it for other animals that we know are happening right now. But I find that particularly when that animal reach sees you and you see it catch their eye, it's one of the most difficult things advocates find. It's actually when they make connection with that animal or they, an animal that's been saved that, you know, doesn't live very long. OK, so breathing in and breathing out. Now, do this regularly. Don't wait till you're so stressed out. Sometimes people have panic attacks. Now, nobody ever died of a panic attack. It feels as if you are, though. We can have this through general life. Things that have happened to us, there's things outside of our advocacy. But a panic attack is an attempt of the body to try to get back into to, to equilibrium, ironically, but it doesn't feel like that, does it? Okay, so breathing in and breathing out. And let's have a look. Are there any comments on that? Have people have done that? Do you immediately feel calmer because i do just even doing this with you okay we're talking, still people a lot of people are talking about the way you know what's happening it's the fear with other people so even as you're thinking about this and you're you're sharing this information we're reading other people's suffering just even knowing about that our physiology changes in a moment cortisol adrenaline stressful hormones it, we, we, they're associations we immediately go gosh my family do that too our physiology changes and we've got to be able to access some of the other states when we are hopeful, when we are at ease, when we're calm, when we've saved an animal, when we're, we're getting results in campaigns. If we can access that, we can change our physiology. And there's some really cool stuff to do with biofeedback that we know. And then happy hormones come into our body. OK, it's hard to be happy about what we see. But if we shift to that, it means that we're more empowered. And when we're empowered, we make better informed decisions. We can be there for animals. We can speak more effectively to other people. OK, if we got anything there. Let's do a breathing. Yes, absolutely. We've already done that. But how are we going for time? Yeah, we're good. We've done the exercise together. So, you know, I'll do that on your other exercises as well. But this is great. Now, also, I'm going to give you a technique which is gold. <laughs> it's so small. I want you to do five minutes a day of doing nothing. We can all do it. Most of us actually 
we'd say, oh, great, I'll sit down, I'll have a look at my goals for the day, or I will listen to some music. That is doing something. <laughs> All right. Learn it. And it's mindfulness, really. When we do that, we sit and we just observe. And we just allow, we check in with our body. We, we, we teach ourselves that we can. It comes like a little sanctuary, I promise you. All right. It sounds so simple. It's hard for us to do. Thoughts go through our minds. When we learn to manage that, I don't like the word controlling it as if it's like, you know, something to be grappled with, but we become compassionate towards ourselves. We are able not to be at the whim of everything that's happening in our world, things to do, things that take our attention, move us, our mind all the time and our, our physiology. Just be present just for five minutes a day. If you keep doing that five minutes a day, it's like putting credit back in the bank. OK, it is absolutely essential. But general relaxation is going to be important as well. You know, sometimes when we will look at different strategies, you'll all have some, but it's very important we have things outside of animal advocacy. It resources us. All right. And if you can be doing yoga and, um, and, and doing some research on mindfulness, that's going to help enormously. I want to share with you a technique that is used in trauma. This is an incredibly powerful technique, often known as the tapping technique. All right. Now, rather than you flipping backwards and forwards, I, I'd say I'll be able to talk about this. Now, in the, in the little chat box, who here has heard about emotional freedom technique? All right. Please just say yes or no or, any, or anyone who has sort of seen it. That's right. Emotional freedom technique. You'll be able to do a little bit of a Google search with that thing. No, most people haven't. And when I came across this, it's very powerful. And I like, I like to explain to people how it works because um, it's very, very powerful. I can't see anyone saying yes. So this is a really great technique. And I teach this to activists and I use it myself. No, nope. fantastic. Emotional freedom technique. So emotional freedom technique is now going all over the world. India, Malaysia, <laughs> Japan. Fantastic. All right. So nobody has seen that. All right. Let me explain to you how it works. I'm going to give you a little bit of a story before I show you. And we're going to do this technique together. All right. Is imagine we've um, we've had some awful tragedies in our worlds, of course. Um, say there is a country that's had a tsunami. You know, very sad history of Indonesia and other countries, a tsunami, and someone has lost a lot of their family. They've lost their village. They've animals. They've, you know, they are in such a state of trauma, post-traumatic stress. The aid worker goes in there to help. And imagine they said to the, the one person or a few people remaining, tell me what happened. You can imagine the person would become so distressed because they would immediately pull back into the images they saw, the associations, the sounds, the cries, the loss, the grief. And so you can't do that. And so the person might just be numb. They might do anything to avoid revisiting all those emotional experiences. But the trauma is so great that their body remembers it. So when they eventually fall asleep, and I say eventually because it interferes with sleep, because they're on high alert and fight or flight, when they've exhausted, fall asleep, um, they're woken up by nightmares about what happened. They go into the kitchen and somebody drops a saucepan lid and they immediately have what we call startle attacks because startle reactions, because they think, was that a breaking branch of a tree? When I, because the body thinks, is it a tsunami again? And they take them back to there. In other words, the body remembers. They may have, um, um, I say flashbacks, startle reactions, nightmares, and they can't talk about it, but their body has got into this high alert. So a technique that is enormously valuable that we can use with people is called emotional freedom technique. It means we don't go into the story, but we actually take the emotion that arises out of that. Now, for us as animal activists, I think debriefing with other people is very important. But if we stay in that story and sometimes we don't want to go through all the details again, we've been there with other people and we've done it, but our body is remembering it. And over time, that stays in the body unless we find a way, as Sean Monson of Earthing said, to filter it. Emotional freedom technique is a way of doing this. This is used for all sorts of things of trauma, of bank holdups, all sorts of things where someone's body is remembering, but if we go through the story, they become even more distressed. All right, so emotional freedom technique, 
is um, really where we're going to be tapping on certain parts of the body. In other words, making contact with what we call our neural nervous system memory. Okay. I like to understand how things work. So I spend a whole long time once um, trying to understand this of emotional freedom. How does it work? How does tapping on the body? And we may have some acupuncturists here or acupressure people. I'm a great advocate of those is that they might say, well, we're tapping on certain part, different meridians. And we'll go through this in a moment. But they might, um, but I think it's about associations and triggers. Everything, acupuncture brilliance, it's even more beneficial. So imagine you wake up tomorrow and suddenly your mom comes into the lounge and she says, the whole world's gone vegan. <laughs> All right, I can see a smile on our faces already. We go, oh my gosh, we would, that would be a positive trigger that takes us into a reality of hallelujah. Or we find out about a bile bear that's just been rescued and got out of somewhere and the trauma of knowing what happened to them, but we got them out and it's great. Or, or that someone's prepared to watch a documentary that we know has the potential to change. We are moved into potential positive. When we remember or we see a similar image or somebody tells us a story of animal cruelty, even the word cruelty is so awful to us that we that is a negative trigger. It triggers us to feel awful. So our bodies switch from positive to negative, positive to negative all of the time. All right. And this happens automatically. And in an instant, our physiology matches that. OK, emotional freedom technique is where we are identifying the emotion we feel, which is the less empowering one um, as a result of what's happened. And we move, teach ourselves to, to resurrect the, pre, the positive emotions that all of us hopefully have felt at some stage in our life, like hope, like connection, like, you know, calmness, being feeling calm or focused. All right. So what I'm going to do is um, I want us to imagine in coming to this conference, when I said to you, how, what's the biggest challenges? Okay, and we're looking at some of those. So I am going to choose three of the words that came of things. So what we would do when you're deciding to do this, and again, I can uh, allow, I can make sure we've got a particular um, link later on so that you can just use this technique. It's actually, actually on my website, I think, but is you would, you're feeling this state of anguish at the time and you were at your way at home and you count all these images come to you. I want you, you would write down three adjectives that explain what you were feeling. You're not going to the story. OK, and what I'm going to choose today is despair. Hopelessness. And let's have another one. Uh, anxiety. All right. All of us can actually. Oh, anger. Let's have anger and um, anger, despair hopelessness. Now, these are all ones that when we're doing our advocacy, we feel you would write those down, but they come into your awareness. OK, you use the hand that you would normally use um, when you're writing. So you're active one. So I'm right handed. So that's the one that's going to be active and that's going to be tapping. In other words, you're making contact with the physical body. You're going to be teaching the body that that becomes a trigger. You're not leaving it to the whim of the world. OK, so let's have a little go at this, a little practice. And I want to see you will feel calmer as you do it. I'm going to feel calmer doing it, but we'll have a practice. Excuse me. Firstly, with all these exercises, you tap into the breathing. OK, just become aware of your breathing. Deepen it a little bit. Let's do this right now. OK, and, and Ellie's going to remind us to do this exercise. So we're going to breathe in. Remember to the count of four. Breathing out to the count of four. Breathing in from the bottom of the stomach, follow it in your mind's eye, and then breathing out. When we're becoming mindful of doing that, we're able to move away from some of the things that trouble us. Breathing in and breathing out. Great. Now, if you're right handed, as I am, I'm using my right hand and I hold the other one out a bit like a karate chop. If it's the other way around, you would do it the other way. All right. So the active hand. And I'm going to remind you. And so I want you to do this. I don't wherever you are in the world. OK, I can do it and be tapping away. So can you. All right. You're going to start tapping and you breathe in and then you would say, you can say in your mind's eye. But you're going to remember I'm teaching you for what you're going to do on your own. You choose the words in the moment. And I would say, oh, although I feel anger, despair and hopelessness, I love, honor and respect myself. And you breathe out. In other words, you're accepting that this is where you are. OK, and sometimes it's hard for us to say those things. We need a little bit more self-care. Although I feel anger, despair and hopelessness, 
I love, honor, and respect myself. Making contact with the body where memory is held. Although I feel anger, despair, and hopelessness, I love, honor, and respect myself. Breathing in and breathing out. And then you take both of your hands. And anybody who knows about chakras, we're touching the crown chakra here. And we tap and we say anger, despair, hopelessness. And we breathe out. And this is what psychologists call visual anchors. We breathe out like a dark sort of smoke or something. Think, Feel it leaving you. All that stuff that relates to that and where that's arisen from. We do this on what's called the third eye. Anger despair, hopelessness. Breathe out. Feel it leaving you. Making contact with the body. Either side of the temples. Anger, despair, hopelessness. Breathe it out. Let it leave you. Okay, because you have a million associations, hormonal reactions to do with those words. Okay, you'll choose the words when you do this at home in the moment. Either side of the cheekbones. Anger, despair, hopelessness. On the chin, anger, despair, hopelessness. Then right in here, we call it the throat chakra, where we almost feel it's so hard to swallow the reality of what we know. Anger, despair, hopelessness. Breathe it out. Might want to tap on the chest here. That is where a lot of grief is held. Our, you know, our complimentary ther therapist will show us this it's it's where and where we hold a lot of grief for the animals anger despair hopelessness and with the hand that's tapping under the opposite of the arm anger despair hopelessness under there and then with the tapping hand on the opposite wrist i'm sure this is to do with meridians in the body anger despair hopelessness Remember, you're breathing in and breathing out. You're letting all this leave you. And with your hand that's tapping over the left of the heart, we do a nice circle and we say, although I feel anger, despair and hopelessness, I love, honor and respect myself. Although I feel anger, despair and hopelessness, I love, honor and respect myself. Nice tap there. Although I feel anger, despair and hopelessness, I love, honor and and respect myself. Put your hands in your lap and just check in with your body. Now you may not feel anything the first time of doing this. You probably, and I do, you feel calmer. You might feel a bit of a cool sensation in your throat. You have moved the energy around. Okay, but you've made contact with the physical body in association with those words which have association for you. All you've done in this first part of this is you are identified without going into the story and you've made contact with the body and you've almost worked through saying, I accept where I am. It's okay to feel like this. What I know, what I see, what I feel, what I remember. Okay. Now that's, we don't want to stay there. Okay. But where, what do we want? How do we want to feel? Okay. I'm going to come up with some words here. I want to feel calm empowered focused oh sorry calm hopeful and empowered that's how i want to feel now i have felt all of those before and i'm guessing that at some stage you have too it might have been when you won something at school an award or you passed an exam you felt calm hopeful and empowered it might do other things your body remembers it and we can tap on this to actually resurrect this is what we do with intention all right so we do the first stage of this and but when we're in the moment of this we've come back from our activism we don't feel like this we feel anger despair and hopelessness so it's no good saying well this is what i feel so we do a bit of reverse psychology we say although i'm feeling that i choose to feel this but when we tap we anchor into the body the association of moving from less empowered emotion to more empowered OK, remember, it works with the deepest traumas. And I did this all the way through emceeing Dominion many times. And I was able to not take that out of the room. OK, it doesn't solve our problems, but it makes us more empowered to keep going and feel more calm in the focus in the world. So we start again. We check with our breathing. We've did the first thing. Then we start tapping here and we say, although I feel anger, despair and hopelessness, I choose to feel calm, hopeful and empowered. Breathing in and breathing out. All right. 
you do it nice and slow and with absolute intention when you're doing this on your own. Although I feel anger, despair and hopelessness, I choose to feel calm, hopeful and empowered. And although I feel anger, despair and hopelessness, I choose to feel calm, hopeful and empowered. And then you take both of those hands, you learn how to, you know, I just don't even need to be reminded where they are now. I tap on your head and you say calm, hopeful, empowered. Breathe out. And then when you breathe in a beautiful visual anchor, almost feel a sort of a beautiful healing color. OK, we do this in positive psychology. We do this with trauma patients. You literally breathe it in and imagine that beautiful healing color coming across you. That becomes your new association not an external trigger of positivity, you're creating it. And those words have associations on the third eye, calm, hopeful, empowered. And breathing out, oh, and breathing in, that beautiful healing color, either side of the temples, calm, hopeful, empowered. We're making contact with the physical, neural, um, nervous system memory. Habit is memory of the body, if you think about it. It's very physical, very visceral. Either side of the, the cheekbones, calm, hopeful, empowered. This beautiful color now coming over the top of your head, down through your face, then your neck, on the chin. Calm, hopeful, empowered. Beautiful healing color. In your throat, calm, hopeful, empowered. The tapping is becoming, a, starting to show your body that you can move to an empowered emotion. Down on the chest, calm, hopeful, empowered, that beautiful healing color coming right down there. Most of us try to calm ourselves and we just stay in the disembodied world of ideas and thoughts. We bring this into our body. This is a technique I've used for many years. It's been the most helpful with my activism. With your active hand underneath the opposite um, arm, calm, hopeful, empowered. I think my acupuncture friends say that my, uh, focuses on our spleen or something. Or, okay, with that tapping hand on the opposite wrist, calm, hopeful, empowered. This beautiful color now coming down the whole of your body, down through your arms, down through your torso. And then with that tapping hand over the little heart, over the um, circling around the heart, Although I was feeling anger, despair, and hopelessness, I choose to feel calm, empowered, and hopeful. Beautiful breathing in and breathing out, this beautiful association of whatever color is good and positive for you. Although I was feeling anger, despair, and hopelessness, I am now calm, hopeful, empowered. If you can bring into any association that beautiful feeling, the fact that you're even tapping and the words immediately bring you the associations of when you've been there before. And then last of all, although I was feeling anger, despair and hopelessness, I am now fully calm, hopeful and empowered. Now put your hand in your lap. You will feel calmer. OK, you might even be able to bring that the words calm. You might actually bring that into your body. I would love to have some feedback on how this has gone for you. Do you feel calmer? Do you feel a little bit? Do you feel no, it hasn't quite worked for me. That's great. Beautiful. I feel calmer indeed, Rachel. It really works, Rachel. And the lovely thing is, the more you do this, you teach your body through. You use the words in the moment. Use the real ones that are challenging and where you want to be. And you move from less empowered, more empowered, less empowered. And the body says, it's soon now, I don't do the whole lot these days. I can be ready to give a big presentation. And I had lots of preparation here because Ellie and the team were so organized. But say I've got something at very short notice. I really wish I had more time. We feel overwhelmed. We feel, you know, we're not doing enough. I will just literally do a circle here. And I say, I'm choosing to feel calm, focused and eloquent or whatever it is because my body goes ah oh, she's tapping i'm moving into positive it's only because i taught the body through habit so the more you practice it is like a self-hypnosis you're right laurie absolutely it's great isn't it great jesse i'm so pleased it is very very powerful it's uh, all activists should be taught it and i use it myself it just so you just get the gist of it moving from less empowered more empowered 
practice, 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 because the key thing is teaching the body the new trigger. Then we're not pulled around by the world. You will be pulled around by the world, of course, but you at any moment can say, no, I'm bringing myself back to resurrect those emotions that I want to feel. It doesn't solve our problems. All right. It doesn't take everything, but it makes you feel calmer. And then we can be there for the animals in the long term but also we can have a place of calm and focus because we also want to experience the world we want to create as vegans we want a vegan world okay and that's very important my friend told me about tapping i never followed it through to learn about it. that's fantastic great laurie and um, i feel tired from the release of emotions it is good yeah you will it's uh, and you might yawn a lot and um, you when you do this you might feel um you might feel you want to burst into tears don't hold that back Tears that are cried in grief and sadness are chemically different than the tears we cry in happiness and laughter. Okay. And the body has a way of getting it through, getting through. If you can do that, you know, even it's not something you were brought up to do, the body needs to do this. We know animals cry too. All right. Let it pass. Fantastic, Jesse. I'm so pleased. Yeah, I feel a bit sleepy. Absolutely. So whatever, when you do this and regularly do it, particularly around activism, particularly around, you know, I feel angry. You could do a phrase, although I feel furious with my family because they won't become vegan. I love, honor, respect myself. <laughs> although I feel furious with them, I'm choosing to feel calm, focused, and find the best words to influence them. You can do all phrases, just make it real for you. That's fantastic. I'm so pleased you enjoyed that. It is very powerful. So please use that. That's great. All right. How are we doing for time? We don't want to run out of time. I've got lots of things to share with you. So let's move on to our next um, tool. I hope you're enjoying this and finding this helpful. I can't see anyone else. Um, I don't know if anyone could see any visuals, but I hope people are waving because I really want this to be helpful for you. Great. OK, now I'm going to give you a little bit of thing. We're going to do another technique in a moment, but I'm going to talk to you about heart brain coherence. If you've ever heard of the Heart Math Institute, it is um, pretty phenomenal again. Here we go. The HeartMath Institute's research demonstrates that different patterns of heart activity have different effects on our thoughts and behavior. Let me tell you a secret. A lot of people think that the brain is the only part of our body that has memory type cells in it. We think of memory as something we remember in our brain. Our heart has 40,000 neurons. I don't know who counted them, but we're talking about a broad amount. That's roughly neuropsychologists believe, neuroscientists believe. 40,000 neurons, memory type cells that have memory in the body. We also know that when we have good news or bad news, we have happiness or we have um, despair or shock or the sort of images we see, our heart registers that before our thoughts register it. Now, this challenges a lot in our modern world where, you know, People are very logical and rational and want to know the science. Our hearts know when we have people say, and that's, of course, becoming vegan and having compassion for animals is very heartfelt. But I want you to know is that non-vegans, ones that look indifferent, there is a reaction in the heart before they, before they do it. However, they may have trained themselves out of it, so to speak, to even imagine. And they don't listen to intuition. They go, you know, they we need to, there's three ways of finding out information. There's intuition, which is very, very important, a very strong sense of knowing, of wisdom, our inner voice, I call it. Then there's listening to other people and finding out information. There's a lot of information out there, particularly on social media. OK, and the next one is a level of critical thought and actually evaluating what we, we find out. OK, a combination of um, of those is all important to make sense of our world. But when we are it say the pattern of heart activity have different effects. So if our the Heart Math Institute provide techniques that have resonance between the brain waves and the heart waves. When these are out of sync, we feel anxiety, we feel anger, we feel upset. When we start, and I'll teach you a technique in the moment to build on this that can bring that heart and brain coherence, we are even able to access the calm, the relaxation, the sense of hope. OK, so it's not just, you know, often we think this is I must change my thoughts and not be so negative. But our body is trying to react to live in this what we know. But when we bring this back together, it can actually change things. So I'm just going to move my slide because I can't actually see the bottom of my slide. So let me just move that. Oh, all right. Why can't I just move my here we go. Let's move that up. Oh. I can't move the screen up, but not to worry. All right. For more than 25 years, they've been searching the heart math connection and learning our heart influences our perceptions, 
our thoughts and other things. You can actually see that. So I really go and have a look at the Heart Math Institute. I have a little device. Unfortunately, I haven't got it to show you on camera, but you can actually um, tap it either to your finger or to your ear and it will give you your heart rate and it will show the heart resonance in the, the heart and the brain waves. OK, oh, um, somebody's going to pass it to me. I've got somebody at home here. Great. I won't practice it. We won't have enough time here. That's a little device like this. You can actually get one. I'm, I'm, I'm not a salesperson for Heart Math Institute for things, but they're, um, it's a little machine. Um, you would put our finger on it and it will show through color. Oops, I'm not going to even do it. Not to worry. But you get one of these little ones. You tap it on either with your finger and you will it will show through a little movement of a color that moves when we're in coherence and when we're not. When we're in coherence, we are more empowered. We're relaxed. We're able to access powerful solutions. We're able to be on top of our game. And that's really important for us in the long haul of doing animal advocacy work. All right, go and have a look at the Heart Math Institute. This is the changing heart rhythms when um, to do with the brain, the coherence between the brain waves and the heart waves. When we're frustrated, look at how all over the place they are. You can go into the Heart Math Institute and see some videos on there. It's really extraordinary. And I once did it in a workshop with people where I got them to think about some problems they had at work. And it was just like that one on the left. And then I taught the person through the technique I'm going to teach you in a moment to go into that connection, to actually become empowered and to imagine. And they access that memory in their body, a bit like EFT, when they felt in control, they're appreciative, they enjoyed things, they felt empowered. And the heart, the little monitor changed. It was quite extraordinary. Then somebody in the group actually said, yeah, well, what about when you go back to work on Monday? And in front of our eyes, because it was we linked it into the computer, it moved to the picture you have on the left. Now, when you know that, you can't unknow it. So when we are feeling the despair and the upset we feel, imagine that everything is out of sync. When it's out of sync, it affects our our well-being. Here's some of the benefits of heart math. Now, look at this. This is extraordinary. Studies conducted with over 11 and a half thousand people in just six to nine weeks of using their training in technology. Maybe they did longer courses, but I'm going to show you one of them. Look at the tremendous benefits. This is a huge sample size. 24% improvement in the ability to focus. Look how we can use this to do the work we're doing. 30% improvement in sleep absolutely essential to sleep. That's going to be one of our techniques. Improving calmness, 46% drop in anxiety, 48% drop in fatigue, and 56% drop in depression. Now, if that doesn't encourage us to do heart math, um, it's got 25 years of scientific research behind it to catch up with what I call common sense, which isn't very common. Isn't that extraordinary? Now, imagine if we were to reduce our anxiety of living in a non-vegan world, we were calmer, we were more focused. We didn't feel so exhausted. And I know some of you said you're heading towards burnout. OK, we and when we can't find a solution to that, we drop into depression. We feel depressed. Anything we do won't make a difference. So I want you to not only seek this out, but I'm going to teach you a technique now. So you're going to have the breathing techniques. You're going to have the emotional freedom and you're going to have a heart math. Here we go. Practical technique, heart math, um, brain, heart coherence. All right. So this is such a simple exercise, but it builds on the breathing exercise. As I said, with all of the ones when you bring you want to bring yourself into being present, we start to breathe. OK, so breathing in and breathing out. Breathing in and breathing out. Nice and gentle. We don't force it. We don't do in, out. We just bring it up and we bring it out again. Breathing in and breathing out. And remember, we've got that self-soothing. It's going to be okay. I'm just going to calm myself. I'm going to learn this heart math technique. All right. Breathing in and breathing out. Now, as you're breathing in, our heart is to the left of our chest. I want you to imagine you're breathing in from the bottom of the stomach. It's coming up, but it's moving up the left-hand side of the body through the heart. This is one of their techniques. But then we breathe back down through the heart. So it goes down through the heart. Breathing up through the heart. Breathing down through the heart. You might even close your eyes and you imagine it coming up through the heart. Visualize it happening and breathing down through the heart. Okay, breathing up through the heart. Down through the heart. 
allow your body naturally to do that. You feel yourself coming calmer already. And now I want you to do, and this is a heart math technique. I want you, as it's doing that, is to expand your compassion, your kindness, outside of yourself to another living being. It could be another person. It could be someone you know. It could be an animal. It could be animals. But just bring it out and expand your heart out to that wider thing. All right? And then bring it back into the heart and imagine it coming out and coming through the heart. Coming out and through the heart. Just feel the calmness that comes from that. That is a very powerful technique. You can do this at any time. All right, you slip into your body, you get into those things. And even the word compassion, kindness, expanding it, send that love to the animal in the cage, to the animal that you're yet to rescue, to all the animals out there. Let's just bring it out for a vegan world. And there's some really cool research I'm hoping I'm going to have time to share with you that actually shows us that thoughts are things, that we can change the outer by changing the inner. Okay, thank you. All right. Any comments on that? <laughs> hey, thank you. Just trying to move this little. Um, oh, here we go. Great. I've been able to move the little thing so I can see the chat. Any comments or anything in there? Thank you. Great. Much enjoying. Oh, I'm so glad you're enjoying it, Amruta. Thank you so much. It was fantastic. Great. It's lovely. These are real techniques that deal with the visceral side of it. Before we even get to self care, this is all self care, but then we got the longer self care. All right. Excellent. Beautiful. I love this. Oh, fantastic, Rachel. I'm so pleased. Great. We're all here for each other. We all use our own. Um, all of us bring our gifts to the party. Hey, perfect. OK, so we've looked at three techniques. This is just a little. Um, so you've got the focused, slow breathing and self-soothing. Remember, it's coming up like a fountain out through. Do that regularly whenever you feel anger whenever you feel you've seen images you've had to edit some footage you've had to you can't believe you've heard another story and i don't live in asia i live in australia and i know i've, I've worked in asia I've worked in um i've worked in india i've worked in taiwan hong kong and um, this is actually before i became a vegan actually i've worked in i've looked walked through the markets in mong kok in uh, hong kong i say taiwan been up into mainland china i've worked in the middle east you know i've seen some terrible things um, we can, this brings us back into that lovely place where we can say, no, I'm going to take that message of those animals out to the world. We're going to be their eyes and ears and we can do this. You've got this. I promise you. Thank you for being activists. Emotional freedom technique. Great. Uh, I'll be able to give some links to that as well, but you're going to have that technique. And then the heart math, the focused intention exercise. These are one, I feel this coolness in my throat. I think that's to do with chakras and energy, but these are wonderful things. And you've got something in your immediate tool bag, but you're bringing the body into that. The really we're really starting to look at um, self-care strategies. Now, this is all self-care, but I want to look at longer term. Now, can everybody see this extraordinary image? This was taken two days ago outside my window of my wonderful minimalist home. That is a beautiful female kangaroo. And can you see the little head popping out from her pouch at her stomach level? <laughs> isn't that extraordinary this this beautiful mother came towards um my house i was trying to keep my dogs inside and this beautiful little baby inside they when you ever see them jump out and they jump in um as they're growing up they're great big often great big ones and they get into that pouch and the strength and isn't this absolutely glorious so i've got these i live in the mountains um about three hours out of side of sydney self-care strategies one of our self-care strategies is being around animals and is being around sanctuaries this is a great reminds us of how animals should be living um you know in natural conditions we we make them in sanctuaries of course okay let's put our things what do you currently do with self-care you know got some extra techniques what do you do and um, do you take time out do you exercise do you talk to other vegans do you watch movies hopefully uplifting one being around animals makes you so happy absolutely i <laughs> have rita said rita said that is that gorgeous the beautiful kangaroo being around lovely yoga meditation oh that's definitely on my list i do both of those self-hypnosis well done laurie 
taking a walk every morning. Yep, these are all on our to-do list. We've got to really make sure we, we bring them away. Excellent. Journaling, yep, that's a very powerful and lovely when we particularly write with our hand. It accesses a younger part of us as well. Yep, writing down, it sort of almost gets it out of us, doesn't it? And keeps it. Taking a bath, excellent. Perfect. With some Epsom salts we have here, which is beautiful. And some um, uh, aromatherapy, putting some little essences in. So it can be wonderful. Good vegan food. Yes, absolutely. Nobody has to suffer, hey, when it comes to eating. I mean, you don't have to give anything up, I say to non-vegans. You just have to stop taking more than what was never yours. Working out, meditation. Yep. Beautiful. What do we got? Um, YouTube videos. Yeah. Coloring, reading. Beautiful working out, exercise, great. Um, the opposite of Kaho, I'm scared of animals. <laughs> that's why I'm going to um, hate going noise. Well, we don't want to go to the zoo because that's not really a, kind of a good place for animals at all. But, um, you know, learn, be around people that can show you. We, we don't need to be scared of animals. It's alert behavior, really. They're, you know, being around them is going to be really important. So, um get around some people that can help you there clear kind of 18 minutes yep lovely okay all right developing resilience the power of the mind just keep moving on charles at the moment first one i'll just start talking about this one have a good diet here we go how not to die nutritionfacts.org all right how not to die this is dr michael gregor go to nutritionfacts.org i have I have a good whole food plant-based diet, okay? Having a higher proportion of vegetables and fruit in my diet, as much unprocessed food as possible. Last night I had vegan pizza um, and early in this week I had vegan lasagna and I have burgers and I eat all the wonderful things we can eat. However, predominantly it's whole food plant-based diet. Okay, now, um, it will change There's all sorts of evidence in this fabulous book you can get as a little very reasonably priced um, download. Um, it actually affects our mood now, okay? It lifts our spirits. So we can't be junk food vegans. So that's important. On to the next one, please. Exercise, 20 minutes of moderate exercise, taking a walk every day, getting out in the sunshine, puts us out of the top 10% of all awful diseases that the average population get before we even become vegan. So it's essential. It actually, it's to do with the whole part of our body. Get out in the sunshine. I know in many countries there's been lockdowns, but having sunshine affects the pineal gland. It produces vitamin D, affects our mood and actually makes it more, and we release a lot of you know stress in our bodies. Okay. Environment, now we've got a couple of things here is the lady on the left is listening to soothing music. Have some really good music around you. And I'm not talking about heavy metal <laughs> and not necessarily, if you enjoy music, please, of course, listen to it, but actually get some calming, soothing music that hasn't got words in it. That's what be my advice because it uses the different part of the brain. Our words are using our left part of the brain, our thinking capacity. And on the right hand side, um, you know, have some plants around your computer. And um, we know it changes the oxygen levels. We need oxygen. Well, a little mosquito person's joined us. <laughs> um, bring plants around, particularly around your computer. The, you know, the energy around that is it can change your mood. Have as much have plants around you. That's really important. If you can't get out and you haven't got a park near you or you haven't got any outside area, you live in an apartment, bring them into your home. I am going to say a few moments on sleep because this is absolutely essential. We're only going to talk for about five more minutes when we get to questions. Is the importance of sleep. Every mammal on the planet needs to sleep. Humans need about seven and a half to eight hours sleep. And some people go, oh, I could never do that or I don't need it. There's very few people that are an exception to the rule. There's very few sleep disorders. Most of them is our modern living having our computer on at night, having our internet on, those sort of things, having those radio waves around us, okay? Now, this is going on to a TED video, T-E-D. It's a bit like YouTube if you don't know it. There's a lovely gentleman there called Professor Matthew Walker. I have read this book twice and I still read it. I still learn about sleep. There is not one organ in our body that isn't positively affected by sleep or negatively effect affected by lack of sleep, okay? Um, we consolidate our memory. Our health is immune system is enormously beneficial. If we only have six hours sleep, sometimes we have a bad night's sleep. Fair enough. We'll drink too much coffee or something. When if we've only had six hours instead of seven and a half is and I'm talking on, on average here is 
we, it's as if we've had a glass of wine when we get into the car or get in on a bus. We can't read the facial expressions of people. So we often get into strife with our family. Okay, I'm gonna tell you a quick story because it's really cool. All animals sleep, uh, insects sleep. But if you ever see any birds on a sleeping at night, I've seen them on a, in Australia in a telegraph wire on a, a bark of a tree, you get a few of them. Birds are able to sleep with half of their brains. So you say you've got five birds, the two and two on the end, the two on the end, when they sleep, they only sleep with the part that is next to the other birds. The other bit is alert to see what's happening. They're looking out for the rest of the flock. Halfway through the night, those two birds swap over so they can rest the other half of their brain and the other half of their brain gets to sleep. Isn't that cool? I think that is so cool. <laughs> okay, so all animals need to sleep and all birds. Do you like that story, Ellie? <laughs> is that a nice one? <laughs> Isn't it fantastic? Okay, you need to get into a routine of sleep. You will go further and farther by actually sleeping well. Social support is absolutely essential. Be around good vegan friends, be around activist friends, okay? It's so important. I can stay here if you like, Charles, that's not a problem. So be around, get good people around you. You might debrief for a while and then you be around people that says, hey, what can we do? Let's exercise together. Let's do yoga. Let's do meditation. Let's relax you know let's watch an uplifting movie let's look at strategies okay but you know be around other people teach other people these techniques so in terms we've got the immediate techniques we can use i want you to put this into your um activacy because you will avoid burnout a whole food plant-based diet predominantly okay exercise if you can bring in um, a walk every day essential you don't have to do hours at the gym. I personally don't go to the gym. I, I've done yoga for 40 years and that's because I'm not doing hours every day. I told myself 40 years ago, I could do 10 to 15 minutes, four times a week at home. Okay. I've been doing that on average about 10 minutes for 40 years. Okay. I don't do it every day, about four or five times. And when it gets to a day when I haven't done it, my body starts to feel stiff. I don't feel pain in my body. I'm very flexible older than a lot of people maybe on this call um because <laughs> i was born in the 60s it's um, an important though okay it's keeping the body supple it gets things moving we release stress we feel well and we're in for the long haul for animals we're going to learn to sleep thing getting up at the same time and going to bed at the same time if you can is essential that's um matthew walker talks about strategies and he says if there's one it gives you 13 strategies by the end of the book and he says if you just listen to the one it's the first one. Try to go to bed roughly at the same time. Get up at the same time. It's, sleep is one of those things. We can't do a double shift, can we? Do 20 hours sleep and then we don't need it for two days. It doesn't work like that. There's all sorts of physiological things. And I tell you, one thing that happens with people with post-traumatic stress, the person in the tsunami, the person watching what's happening in the slaughterhouse, is when we sleep, at the top of the brain, the spinal column opens. A fluid moves across the brain and almost processes those very painful emotion, emotions, the, the remnants of the chemicals. This is really cool information. When somebody has post-traumatic stress and their sleep's interfered with, this process, which happens in about the third cycle of sleep, doesn't happen. And that's why people get stuck in this awful trauma because the body physiologically can't move it out of the system. All right, so we're gonna sleep well, we're gonna allow our body to do the work it needs to do, and then we can be in the long term for the animals. Social support, have good people around you, come to conferences like this, watch uplifting stuff, We watch a lot of challenging stuff, have wider interests, cook, do yoga, read, watch funny movies, uplifting ones. I, I listen to Gaia TV myself. It's, I don't have a television. I have not had a television for 17 years. I can still watch bits of the things that I need to see, but I don't want to be advertised to or to that stuff telling me what to watch and be negative. I can access it, do something with it, and then create that vegan world. Meditation. Um, I'm hoping we'll have time for a very short meditation. We'll have to see, but if not, I can, again, there is a whole 10 minute and a 20 minute one meditation on how I'm creating a vegan world. So, um, and also go to sanctuaries, be around animals. All right. So these are some of the strategies I want you to put in place. And then how confident are you that you can make a positive difference for animals? Let's get that poll up. It's our last one. 
skeptical, but motivated, excellent, lovely, very confident. Yeah, it is challenging, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, feeling money won't really make a significant. That is normal and predictable. Of course it is. Absolutely. So, you know, really enjoy the winds. Keep, I want you to realize something. A rising tide of water raises all boats. Everything we do is going to be really important. The bigger picture is the power of the mind. Well, I was going to do a quick, just, I'll do it in 30 seconds, one, 15 seconds. If I was to take you through an exercise to imagine eating a lemon, can you, by the time I told you, your face would be screwing up and you'd almost be able to oh don't tell me that I can do it do a little task with your friends in other words the memory of the lemon can make us wince and almost as if we we're doing that but guess what we're not eating a lemon we just have to imagine it therefore the power of the mind okay and so the meditation I know I won't have time to practice with you but we can you can access afterwards is actually when we visualize the vegan world we want to create a one of compassion, kindness, freedom, animal liberation for all, we will are able to physiologically change our place to a place of what that's like. But there are a lot of really cool studies out there that show that when we change our inner reality through our thoughts, that we, in fact, we are able to change our outer reality. Thoughts are things. And um, because I'm not going to have time to go through it, there are connect links and videos on my site to do with things called peacefulcities.org. When groups of people come together and meditate, they will change what physically happens in a particular area during the time they are meditating. Also the Maharishi studies with transcendental meditation. So imagine we can get a lot of, when we meditate, quantum science tells us the outer is the inner. Okay, so this is why we're having a massive growth in veganism because not, I'm finding people are becoming vegan in the middle of Ohio, in the, in the deep west of America, and young kids are becoming vegans. They suddenly were not having part of eating animals. They've never heard the word veganism. That's what we call the collective unconscious. But it's a great question from Kaho from Japan. Sometimes I feel hesitant to share any positive posts on my social media, knowing there are many humans and non-humans in pain. Maybe I don't want to be a source of toxic positivity. How can we move beyond this state of mind? Well, it's also realizing that um, when you share positive things about animals, people often warm to it because people aren't indifferent to animals. They actually see, um, you know, the potential for, you know, we're speciesists. So often people will associate with certain animals is always have the message there, I think, is actually this is how it can be for all animals, you know, and have a little bit of advocacy going in there. Um, it is a mindset shift. It's we're holding a vision for a world for animals when we know so many are in so much pain. OK, I think it's important to share it, but with a little message. That says, you know, when I share images of pigs, for instance, when I've been to a sanctuary, I say, you know, what is the difference between a dog and a pig? You know, and I also, isn't it so terribly sad that actually and wrong, morally indefensible, that actually this isn't the same. And all of this behind closed doors and this suffering for animals. Um, and it, this is how it should be for all. Knowing that sometimes a chink of consciousness, remember, when that, by, Bob, that guy called Bob Geldof actually wrote that book called Is That It? In 1979, I read the story of something challenging. And that was the beginning of, I gave up me on the spot. Okay, we never know when someone's going to. So share, share animal things of actually the world they should be living in and then remind people that, you know, this is how it should be for all and how we treat animals is ultimately how we treat each other. So sometimes we have to get them through the sort of more speciesist human sort of stuff to say, to bring that to others. Okay, I know it's a very short answer, um, but I, I, I know that actually, you know, we want to awaken the hearts of people, remind them of a compassion that I believe they've been, been knocked out of them. I don't think we're born like this. We've, we've been taken out of us. Okay, thank how you are we doing? Thank you very much, Claire. Thank you. 
I think we do Thank need you. to wrap up soon. Is there yep. any other way people could pos potentially get in touch with you about the remaining questions? Or yeah, could they, could Charles? Could you go to my very last slide, which has some resources on it? There's some Thank freebie you. 30 day training for communication. There's a, the meditation. You here we go. Resources to help you. I've got some webinars I'm doing. There is a 30 day mini video program that you can get. You can sign up for it free on my website. You'll get a little short video between two and six minutes of a particular technique of how to communicate. When someone says, oh, if we don't eat animals, they'll overrun the world or all the ridiculous things that us vegans have to put up with um, or those sort of things or and how do, you know, family are eating animals and things. That's free on there. There's an overcoming stress and anxiety program on audio. There's a meditation on there, creating a vegan world. And there's a four part myths of choice, why people won't change and what we can do about it. And there's some, and there's a relationship course. That's a, a program you can um, get hold of. So these are resources. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everything you're doing. And I really look forward to joining you again in the future. And um, together we're creating a vegan world. Please connect with me on social media. I'd love to be in contact with you. All right. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much. Thank you, Claire, for joining us. That was such an important, inspiring and, and empowering talk. Thank you so much. Um, let's give Claire another round of jazz hands. Thank you so much, <laughs> thank Claire. You. Thank you. And have a wonderful conference. See you soon.